uh, feel free uh, to share your questions uh, via a chat option. So I'd like to introduce uh, the first speaker who is uh, Melissa Fleming, who is uh, the Under Secretary General for Global Communications at the United Nations. Um, this is uh, a person who is responsible for informing global audiences about the state of our world and uh, explaining um, how the UN works to make it better. Uh, Melissa oversees uh, the UN news, information and digital communication operations. Uh, she runs campaigns on crucially important issues uh, such as uh, climate emergency, COVID-19 pandemic, and of course, uh, disinformation. Previously, she worked at the UN Refugee Agency, um, International Atomic Energy Agency, as well as the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe at uh, where I had, um, senior um, positions responsible for overseeing media, outreach, press, and public information operations. Um, Melissa, welcome, uh, welcome to Oxford. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you very much for that for that introduction, and it's it's great to be with you. Um, when you were talking about my my bio and my background, I I remember the days before social media, and when my job was um, first and foremost and primarily and almost only to communicate with journalists and to try to reach the population via journalists. So it is we are living in a, in a completely different um, age. And um, I don't know if I'm gonna be giving uh, much good news about our current information age, but I just to say, it's really great um, to be with you. It's really good to see that Oxford is, is studying this phenomenon. Um, and we're very specifically uh, going to talk, talk about lessons learned from two years of working to combat mis and disinformation around the COVID-19 pandemic through an initiative called Verified. Um, this is an initiative that I worked very closely with our other panelists here today, Gautam uh, Raju, um, who was leading um, from the side of, of the um, organization Purpose, which was our partner um, it, for the Verified Initiative. So here we are gathered as the Northern Hemisphere braces for a third pandemic winter, WHO has said, that actually we're, we've never been in a better position to end COVID-19 as a global health emergency, only if. But as new variants are emerging, we've seen, a, I'm sure the country you're in, the country I'm in, and many other countries have just let their guard down. Hospitals are filling up again, um, and governments have far fewer measures in place to limit the spread of the virus. Um, We've seen surveillance drastically reduced, testing and sequencing rates are also much lower. At the same time, equally, the promotion of reliable information on the pandemic has also fallen through the cracks. Um, indicatively, in, in July, Facebook announced that it would turn over to its oversight board uh, to decide whether to end restrictions on COVID-19 mis- and disinformation. So we'll watch that space. Um, in our view, it is no time to end. Um, and ending restrictions means a blossoming of even more conspiracy and, and misinformation around the pandemic. So um, as um, at the UN, we have definitely been monitoring the what infodemic phenomenon as coined by WHO um, from the early days of the pandemic. We saw a absolute flood of harmful mis- and disinformation spreading virtually on primarily social media and of course competing with less compelling public health content and guidance. The conspiracy theories were wild um, from claims that the pandemic was a hoax to claims that um, it was planned to trigger the rise of a new world order and we saw millions of lives being lost as a result. Um, people just ignoring health guidelines or taking miracle cures that um, got them 
nowhere except perhaps in the grave. So once the vaccines arrived and we anticipated this too, the narratives shifted, the focus shifted there and the vaccines were presented as a plot to depopulate the planet. Um, it was said that vaccines could make you sterile uh, and that they were more dangerous than actually getting COVID. Um, so when, just an aside, when monkeypox now emerged, we saw claims it was caused by the COVID-19 vaccine. So this is, uh, you know, this, we're also seeing, uh, and UNICEF has reported a, a really significant decline in vaccine uptake in general, not just COVID-19 um, vaccine, but uh, childhood vaccines are taking a hit because of all the resulting vaccine hesitancy um, uh, from from this um, from this period. So also, um, COVID-19 is like spilling over into other areas, even Ukraine. There are conspiracies now that monkeypox was invented as a bioweapon in the lab in a lab in Ukraine. So the, the thing is, I mean, we all laugh and find these conspiracy theories wild, um, but um, unfortunately, they have gained so much traction and plausibility and credibility that millions of people believe them. Um, and research finds um, that even though these many of these conspiracies are completely widespread, they mostly stem from a relatively small group of actors. Um, there was one analysis from the Center on Countering Digital Hate that found that just 12 accounts were responsible for up to two thirds of anti-vaccine content on Twitter and Facebook, just 12 accounts. Um, they're called, they were the disinformation dozen. And who are they? They are snake oil salesmen and entrepreneurs and quack doctors, alternate medicine practitioners and publishers. They peddle fake cures, books, courses and DVDs and many of them are based in the US. Um, I, you know, I, I, there was one um, I encountered who, who I actually, um, it was crazy when I looked at his bio and I was saying, his name looks really familiar. Um, I remember encountering him when I was diagnosed with cancer in 2016. Um, and I was searching for, oh, you know, just putting in the keywords in Facebook, chemotherapy and, um, what did popped up in my feed, but the truth about cancer run by this, this man. And the truth about cancer was basically trying to tell me that I didn't need to take chemotherapy. In fact, it would be ill-advised and that there are alternative cures. Now this guy has become one of the biggest super spreaders of COVID-19 mm -hmm. um, mis and disinformation. So, you know, we really needed, need to study this phenomenon. We weren't going to be able to stop these disinformation actors themselves, although exposing them is absolutely key. But what we needed to see is how this was being spread. spread. So these, you know, conspiracy theories being dreamed up in Tennessee or Florida were seen by people in all corners of the world, and they were having a detrimental effect on what we, the WHO, um, the um, COVAX initiative was trying to achieve, and that was to get um, treatment, uh, public health measures, masks, um, and vaccines to the most vulnerable people on earth. Um, and you know, even in places where vaccine confidence in parts of Africa was really high, we were seeing as a result of these conspiracy theories seen on social media that many were starting to refuse the measures or to take the vaccine. Um, there's one example of, uh, that really struck me um, of a Namibian football coach, um, Marley, who lost 15 members of his family to COVID within weeks in the summer of 2021. He himself was the only one who got vaccinated, but his, all of his family members hesitated because of conspiracy theories they had seen on social media. And it was really a wash all over in Namibia, social media, um, the mis and disinformation. And um, so many died and the family had to bury three loved ones in one day alone. Um, so, you know, although they went and hurried to get the shots after that, it was really too late. And these stories are incredibly frustrating for the United Nations. Um, it was really um, a few bad actors who were undermining uh, undermining um, 
uh, undermining what we were trying to do. But the thing that it wasn't just the bad, the back, bad actors may have had an audience of a hundred um, or an audience of a thousand in the pre-social media age. Uh, the capability that they had and their um, masterminding of the algorithms um, using their, their, their person um, inserting themselves and their personal stories uh, was and and you know flouting these theories um, in terms that were full of um, hope outrage um, uh, really uh, worked into the algorithms um, in a way that was difficult um, to compete with when we were working on a novel virus uh, that was changing where public health guidance also needed to be adjusted. Um, but we knew that we needed to do something about this, um, not only to go and reach out to the social media platforms, which we did. Um, we also asked them to promote um, the content that was available from WHO, which to an extent they did. However, um, the phenomenon was way too big. So we decided we needed to be proactive ourselves with our own communications. And that's where the verified initiative came in, which aimed to, as in the words of the Secretary General, flood the internet with science solutions and solidarity and effectively, hopefully, I mean, it was an ambition to drown out um, the lies by being in that space. Um, there were places actually, uh, which were kind of data holes where um, people were searching, weren't finding anything and the mis and disinformation would get into that space. And so we were trying to get there first um, and our content focused, it was very much taking guidance from WHO, but putting it into, and you're going to see from Gautam uh, what this content looked like, um, into um, cool, uh, engaging posts um, that would could be adapted in multiple languages and contexts, um, and that traveled well on social media and penetrated the digital um, spaces in ways that we at the UN did not have the capability um, to produce and also distribute. Um, Gautam will talk more about the strategy, but we learned, I have to say, a lot of valuable lessons. Um, and it the lessons that we learned continue to guide our global communications because the phenomenon of mis and disinformation and, even, and also hate speech traveling on social media um, is not just uh, disrupting public health, but it is also um, disrupting democracies. It is um, giving, it's inciting violence, um, even atrocities at, at mass scale. And um, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it is a phenomenon that we need to address also in the field of climate change and climate action. So um, we believe that, um, you know, of course, all efforts are in vain if our content is not seen. Um, so we need to learn the tricks. We needed quickly to learn the tricks of the trade to make sure um, our content could also have a chance of going by viral. Um, and we need, so we needed to test. We needed to look at audiences um, and, you know, test messaging, test uptake. And, and adjust and change very quickly, um, depending on how well it was doing. Um, but one, one of the other things that we really saw at the outset and just took a chance on doing was um, that we, it was clear to us and we just assumed that we could not do, tackle this alone. Um, we needed to work with uh, our global community. I mean, the UN has for a long time worked with many uh, influencers who have massive followings on social media, mostly celebrities, we tapped into that network. But we also, through the Verified Initiative, started um, recruiting people at different levels, um, you know, influencers who um, were micro-influencers or even nano-influencers in their communities and even taking a step back as the United Nations and not having our logo anywhere. Because the most important thing was um, for the, the people we were trying to risk, reach, who do they trust? Um, and can we equip those trusted messengers with, our, with the messaging? We had so many people willing and wanting to help um, that it was um, actually quite a, a, an exciting experiment that we have evidence worked extremely well 
to reach what we think is about a billion people and Gotham is gonna go into this much more. And finally, you know, we, we also realized that um, the other thing that we needed to do was help people navigate online um, and we call it media literacy um, or netiquette, uh, but uh, we uh, it looked into behavioral science and found that, um, and the phenomenon of how mis- and disinformation um, it spreads and spreads. I mean, it is of course, algorithmic recommendations is one way, but it's also people um, in a, in a, at the height of a, an emotive response, uh, just sharing without taking the time to review the, the post and the content um, and its, its credibility. So, um, People do react in a knee-jerk and emotion-driven way. And so we um, launched a global campaign, which is still ongoing, and it's called Pause uh, or Pledge to Pause. And the mantra that we want everybody to have in their head um, is take care before you share. Um, and you know, over time, we, you know, we tested this. Also, MIT worked with us. And with, um, we did have evidence that with repeated exposure to this mantra, uh, that users became more selective with what they shared online, which did in effect, slow some of the spread of lies and misleading content. So we're really emphasizing, um, emphasizing uh, media literacy. Um, also, um, you know, it is clearly the job of institutions like the United Nations and public health institutions to do better. Um, we need to communicate facts and science in ways that are um, going to be compelling to people. I, I just read a recent study that um, the biggest source of news for young people in the United States is TikTok. And yet one in five of the posts uh, that were studied in, in the US and in many other countries in the world in this study were misinformation. So what is, you know, what we need to be there. Um, this was a NewsGuard um, study. And, um, you know, the videos that were automatically suggested by the platform contained misinformation. And, and we could go into this for a long time, the algorithms of all of the big social media platforms um, have, um, we have evidence that uh, lies are traveling faster and further than verified facts mm -hmm. um, and pushing people down extremist rabbit holes. So we do believe that algorithms and we know because sometimes um, social media uh, companies have made the decision to tweak their algorithms um, that they could be directed to filter out more hate, more mis and disinformation and also to curate content that would highlight reliable, reputable, sources of information um, instead of amplifying conspiracies and lies. And um, so we, you know, obviously are doing what we can to advocate to the platforms. Um, and we believe that this situation is, because the situation is putting not only society's hate, health, but also our peace and even the future of our planet at stake. I just, just a couple of words on because one of the other areas of priority that we're communicating on is um, climate change. Um, climate change is um, what we believe the biggest, um, the biggest uh, crisis that is facing our planet right now. Yes, the Ukraine war as well. Yes, hunger and inequality and um, pandemics, but the climate emergency could be, um, could be what really destroys us. So um, we're really, really concerned to see false or misleading leading content um, continuing to circulate online, um, which is warping public understanding. It's undermining mining climate science, and it's ultimately delaying urgent climate action. Um, so this is really a problem. And we see some of the same actors, fossil fuel companies behind it. Um, we also see disinformation's impact in our conflict situations too. For example, we recently surveyed our United Nations peacekeepers and 44% said mis and disinformation 
was having a critical impact on their work. And a similar number said that it was severely impacting their own safety. So we're finding, you know, in the social media age, it is harder for the UN to operate. Um, and we're monitoring, obviously, the situation in Ukraine with no less concern. There's an information war raging, and it's, uh, you know, not just in the theater of war, but it is um, all over the world. And, um, and you know, even, even um, though, you know, the UN had judged in 2018 that the, the unspeakable atrocities that happened against the Rohingya population in Myanmar um, were linked to disinformation and hate speech spread online, um, on Facebook in particular, uh, we're still seeing this phenomenon in many other parts of the world. Um, for example, genocide denial um, around the Srebrenica genocide um, and the Holocaust, as well as like glorification of war criminals in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we do think that this is needs to be a moment of reckoning. And we, we need to use this kind of model that we've developed at Verified to um, to really push and, and bring together the forces for good, universities like yours, um, pop, you know, institutions like the United Nations. Um, there's a whole industry now that has been set up that impresses me so much um, that is trying to make our internet um, more humane. Um, and I think, you know, if we all join forces, we could um, demand more of the platforms. And, um, and also ourselves as institutions get better at uh, communicating. We are, at, in my team, I'm leading a um, process to develop a UN code of conduct on integrity and public information. This is a call by the secretary general in his Our Common Agenda report. And so we are gonna be consulting far and wide with our country teams on, in every, on virtually every country on earth to see from their perspective, what is the harm that they are seeing, um, but also talking to academics like you, um, civil society groups, experts, governments, to see um, how we can you know, hold the industry accountable for the dangerous side effects of its business models and, and work for um, a social media, which does have the potential of being what it claims to be, a space of connection and community and exchange but obviously that can't happen until platforms fundamentally reconfigure the tools being used to harm society, move away from their for-profit surveillance business model and threaten, which is threatening the future of our planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Amazing. Uh, very, very important introduction into um, current UN agenda on fighting disinformation. I couldn't agree personally with you more. I would like to uh, quickly introduce our next speaker uh, before we, we move to questions. Uh, next speaker is uh, Gautam Brajil, who is most importantly our um, own visiting policy fellow here at uh, Oxford in in Internet Institute, so News Foxford. And um, besides that, he is a managing director at Europe of Purpose where he led a number of very important campaigns, global campaigns, covering regions across Europe, Africa, Asia, US, covering important health, uh, digital rights, and other types of topics. He recently co-led, I already mentioned, uh, initiative uh, that uh, combined efforts of the United Nations um, and leading uh, trusted voices to campaign as a response to growing, uh, in growing uh, spread of online misinformation around COVID-19, COVID-19 pandemic. And this campaign, can you imagine, it reached more than 1 billion people, 1 billion, it's a huge number. And that's uh, what uh, uh, Gautam will speak in a second, I hope. Um, uh, previously, he worked uh, as a head of digital campaigning at Oxfam International, uh, covering, uh, uh, again, basically the whole world and uniting, uh, uniting uh, digital efforts around uh, informing publics and uh, helping people to understand and uh, learn uh, from trusted 
information sources. Uh, welcome, uh, Gautam, and uh, uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much, Alexandra, and, and thanks so much, Melissa. I think, uh, you know, uh, um, a very inspiring rally, a, a rally and call to arms to, to platforms to take greater action as, as we've been working, as we've been, uh, you know, very focused on in the last two years is, you know, that's the kind of core of where we see um, where we can really create quick change and systemic change. Um, I'm just going to share my screen uh, and I'm hoping that everyone can see that. Uh, let me know if not. Looks like people can see it. Cool. So yes. uh, as Melissa spoke about, um, we launched Verified. Uh, we, we started talking about launching something in March um, when the pandemic first hit. And in about May, we had to sort of come together to brand and build this identity called Verified. And essentially Verified, as Melissa spoke about, is a, is a, is a combination of using an organization like Purpose, which is um, an organization of campaigners, public engagement strategists, creatives, technologists, policy experts. Um, uh, you know, about, we're about 200 people globally, um, uh, and we work with you know, large-scale foundations, philanthropies, uh, civil society groups to mobilize publics around um, progressive issues and progressive policies uh, change. Um, and combining that kind of agility and creativity with the, cred the credibility, the authority, the reach, um, and the role of the UN to come up with this idea of Verified, um, to reach publics um, all around the world um, as we went through this sort of unprecedented crisis, global crisis, and this infodemic, as the Secretary General referred to, um, to kind of combat the, 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 the huge amounts of misinformation that was flying around. Um, <coughs> Essentially what Verified is and how it operates is um, in three kind of main ways. One, we call it the content engine. And so essentially we work with um, the UN system networks. So um, obviously with the Secretary General's Department of Global Communications who sets the agenda of what we're communicating and the entities surrounding the, uh, surrounding the UN like the WHO and the agencies like UNICEF and UNHCR to um, understand um, what the priorities are around communication Communications. And so um, in the heart of the pandemic in, in March 2020, I'm sure we all remember, wash your hands, wear a mask, stay at home. Um, uh, the creation of that content, um, the curation of that content, um, and the commissioning of that content to, to partners to get that content out in the world, um, the testing of that content and the continual optimization of that content to make sure that it's being effective in reaching um, target audiences, and the distribution of that content. Because as Melissa referred to, as we as we were as we were releasing this content and getting it out, it wasn't just the UN's voice that would, was was holding credibility to all the audiences we were trying to reach. And so developing partnerships who had access to different audiences that we're trying to mobilize and engage through the process. So it was kind of that three phase process that this the verified model has been taking over the last two years. And then through this process, we've been developing hundreds and hundreds of insights um, uh, that, you know, some of which I'm sharing to, to you today, I'm just sharing as a small snapshot um, of what we have, but there, are t there is so much that we've learned over the last few years, and we've started working with our partner network to share those insights, particularly with civil society, to help build their capacity to respond to misinformation, as Melissa referred to, misinformation doesn't just happen around COVID, it happens around many issues, and so having, building that kind of muscle to be able to respond to it was you know, really um, a big part of what, we, what we've done over the last two years. Um, in terms of where we've landed, in terms of um, the impact that we've had um, uh, at, a, at a global scale, um, we've produced about 10,000 pieces of different content over the last two, two, and, a, two, two and a half years um, uh, in over 60 different languages, um, reaching conservatively over 1.5 billion people with uh, over 800 different partners around the world that we've been working with who carry our content, who either take our messages, carry our content, push out, push out different videos that we have. We have range of, a range of different partnerships that organizations, individuals, influencers will sort of engage with us on. And so this network is continually uh, given the content of the priorities of the time that we're pushing out. Um, and we're kind of working across four themes, uh, 
countering misinformation around COVID-19, equipping the public with um, accurate health, uh, public health information, building solidarity and particularly um, pushing for a fair and equi equitable recovery, um, and then um, you know, uh, building confidence in the vaccine um, has been a core part of our work. Uh, and we've kind of shifted and changed across, um, across uh, as the pandemic has changed and then evolved from the start where uh, there was no vaccine and it was about getting people to stay at home and wash their hands and wear face masks to as the vaccine was being developed, we um, started developing communication strategies around building trust in the vaccine before it was even available. And then when it was available, campaigning for, for an equitable vaccine, but also countering um, misinformation around the vaccine, as Melissa, Melissa referred to. And now we're looking, our focus is very much on um, pushing for equitable recovery from the pandemic. Um, Here's a, here's a quick snapshot of um, the content. As I said, there's been 10,000 different pieces of content that we've created from um, one second video gifts to, um, you know, uh, radio clips that were played across, you know, community radio across India to songs and jingles that were played across um, broadcast channels in, um, in Malawi <laughs> um, to, um, you know, a partnership with um, uh, the Pope and the Catholic Church where we're pushing out messages around that. There's been so many different people involved in this initiative um, across the world, across religions, across countries, across faiths, and that's credit to the UN who just can activate and turn on all these people um, around this emergency that we've been in. Um, and let me jump to the next thing. So as I referred to before, our strategy has evolved over, um, over the last kind of uh, three years, two to three years. In 2020, it was around really um, turning the, um, the, the, the credible information that was available at the time into consumable content for audiences. And so um, what we found and what we were seeing was traditional public health institutions, talking about the NHS who we worked closely with in the UK as an example, didn't have the communications capacity to respond to the crisis in a quick agile way as the pandemic was evolving. Um, WHO were producing massive reports around face mask wearing, but it, that content wasn't consumable and we were, winning the, we were losing the war against some of these bad actors who were using, who were getting onto that stuff and countering it really quickly. And so our strategies were, we can play that game as well. We can create the content and we can also be first um, first out to market, so to speak, to be able to count that stuff. And so 2020 was really focused on that. In 2021, as the vaccine became available, it was much more targeted campaigning um, to encourage vaccine uptake, dispel rumors, um, ra that rapid response mechanism um, uh, and, 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 and other you know, misinformation that was happening around COVID and encouraging safety behaviours where the vaccine wasn't available and then in encouraging vaccine uptake where the vaccine was available. So we had strategies as the vaccine was being deployed out the world. And this year, um, you know, what we've learned is that nobody wants to talk about COVID anymore. It's a real challenge for us to work with partners on COVID. Where we, you know, uh, when we at the start of the year, when we started speaking to different the organisations that we've been working with over the last kind of two years, we're like, okay, we want to continue COVID nineteen vaccine vaccination push. They're like, nobody wants to talk about the vaccine. Every, you know, and that's been a real challenge for us this year. And so what we've done is we've pivoted to focus on recovery issues, and so issues that have um have have fallen beh behind or struggled through as a result of the pandemic. So we're looking at um violence against women. We're looking at hate speech. We're we're looking at um, uh, pushing the continuing, continuing, continuing to push the pause messaging, continuing to study misinformation, how to combat it, um, and looking at other crises like climate change as well. So um, we've been experimenting a lot this year in that in that space. Um, so that's 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 a bit of the content, um, and there's some key lessons. Um, I'm going to try to get through this quickly because um, I want to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, when the pandemic first hit in March 2020, and what we know, and what I'm sure people here who are researching this knows, is that when um, in an emergency um, uh, where there is a lack of good information, we know missing, that's where misinformation really flourishes. Um, and so as a result of that, the content engine that we built was, was um, cur like creating the content to combat uh, misinformation as we were saw, uh, as we saw it through the social 
listening that we were doing, but also at what our partners were telling us they were seeing. And we we're creating content, distributing to the partners and getting them to push it out through their networks. We we're also creating tons of unbranded content um, that we're pushing out through different platforms, partnerships with platforms to reach those audiences. Um, so you can see two examples here of uh, the different pieces of content that we made. The first content is a, is is one that um, we we produced uh, and pushed out through WHO channels and um, the, the the more the, the the bigger institutions that we we're partnering with, where we we're turning out some of the um, the academic research papers into um, these like small gifts um, that were then kind of uh, work in partnership with the social media platforms to kind of accelerate um, and prioritize on their platform when people were talking about. Um, you know, what sort of masks, there was lots of conversations about which sort of mask could I wear, what is effective and what isn't. And so we we're creating these kind of bit-sized pieces of content to reach audiences. And we kept kind of um, changing that and optimizing it as we saw how it was, how audience were reacting to it and how they were responding to it. The second piece um, uh, of content here that you can see is a piece of content in the partnership that we made with, um, I think over 50 to 60 different artists. Um, and we created pieces of, and this is when the vaccine had become available and we we're trying to, um, you know, when you'd get your vaccine, you would get a badge. And so we wanted to create kind of a social proof badge that we could partner with uh, Giphy. So Giphy, for those of you who don't know, Giphy is kind of like the GIF library that you would have on WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger. So if you're like WhatsApping your and you send them a GIF, it's all pulled from one directory and that directory is run by Giphy or Tenor. And so we created two partnerships with them um, where we, um, if someone typed in vaccine, the, our whole, our, our kind of Giphy pack would come up. And so people were encouraging to share that they were getting vaccinated. Or if you typed COVID-19, our GIFs would come up. You know, these GIFs were used something from 100 to 140 million times from there, from the stats that we've got out uh, from them. And so it was about, Getting, getting onto those platforms, flooding those platforms with our content before the bad actors could flood that content with like um, COVID misinformation gifts. And so that was a core, one of our successful parts of our strategies as we were, as we were going through um, uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, so a couple of key, key lessons here that we, that, we, that we found is, as Melissa referred to, be the first to get out the facts um, and also clarify facts as the pandemic was evolving. So as we were learning more about was it, what was effective in terms of, change, um, in terms of um, uh, preventing the pandemic, you know, keeping two meters apart or 1.5 meters apart, or we, we kept creating content as more and more things um, happen. Um, and to, so we're staying on top of it and continuing to clarify um, uh, some of these kind of messages as they're coming out. And one, one lesson that we learned through a lot of the, our partners that we worked with, um, who were like fact checking organizations and misinformation academics, were that repeating misinformation can reinforce it. Um, but instead of that, um, the way to counter it was through um, well founded counter narratives that didn't actually repeat the misinformation, but used way, interesting ways to kind of creative ways to kind of counter that. And here are some different um, gifts that we that, that we used over the over the last um, couple of years that that is still kind of relevant now. Um, another core part of um, another core part of our strategy was digital literacy, and so as we as we um, as the pandemic push, uh, sort of continued, we knew that in, you know um, the big challenge that we had is, um, uh, and obviously the challenge had always existed, but kind of ex had accelerated. Everyone was at home on the internet, um, reading uh, you know reading all sorts of different articles. Is that digital literacy is a huge gap and a huge um, a huge need for investment, um, and there just isn't a ton. We, what we realized is there just wasn't a ton of content out there that was consumable for publics to be able to understand what the rules. Like you know, you've got don't drink or drive, right? For for for, for alcohol, it's like what are the rules of the road? The internet doesn't really exist, and we thought you know the UN is a global authority, a credible source. They would be you know they they could help set some of the rules for the road of how we should use in the internet. And so we developed this campaign called Pause, and and as Melissa referred to, the whole concept about pause. Uh, of pause is about trying to get people to stop. Um, and you know the, the evidence that we had seen that developed that campaign was that getting people to stop um, basically uh, 
uh, re rapidly reduces the spread of misinformation. And so it's either a kind of like psychological pause or creating a pause or friction within the platform, um, uh, which kind of would drop misinformation. But uh, and by that, I mean, like, for example, Twitter deployed this kind of um, this uh, fix within the platform that if you hadn't read the article, you couldn't retweet. You had to kind of, and that and that was a really effective way of, of reducing misinformation. And so we saw those kind of things working, and we developed this campaign called Pause. Um, I can uh, you can see here um, uh, some of the different pieces of content that we made. Um, uh, uh, what we knew is misinformation in particular was is always designed to hijack emotions. And so people would get an, an emotional rush out of sharing misinformation or sharing, sharing content, particularly when it's out, like it, it sparks your emotion. And so some of our content at the start of the Pulse campaign was about kind of explaining how mis, how content and misinformation spreads um, and, and that we want people to take care before they share. Um, and some of the top, these, these two pieces of content here up here, which is a simple call to action of what we want people to do um, to identify misinformation was one of the most effective. It's very simple, um, a very simple share graphic, but one of the most effective pieces of content that we had in the entire two, two three years that we work um, was shared you know, hundreds of thousands of times um, across partners and different audiences um, as the pandemic um, uh, 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 sort of continued and played out. Um, uh, and then you can see more of those on the bottom left hand side, you can see more of those gifts that were kind of um, uh, developed with Giphy to get to encourage people to, to pause as they were sharing content on WhatsApp. Um, uh, and then um, the, 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 the cr more creative kind of um, share graphic that we have up there around using, um, you know, a common nursery rhyme to kind of encourage people to, to check their facts before they share. We deployed these across many different partners in many different ways. These are the more traditional um, activations that we did and they were accelerated by the, our social media partners as well through ad credits and prioritization through the algorithm um, as well as, uh, and this is more interesting, uh, uh, is we developed kind of interesting partnerships with different organizations to carry the message of pause and the important um, importance of taking care before you share. So in the, at the top there is a partnership um, one of the most interesting campaign partnerships I think I've done with Hello Kitty. We got Hello Kitty to come out to encourage their audiences to um, around digital literacy um, and talking through the steps of how you accurate, uh, how do you how you verify um, content um, and and why you should take action before you share. In the bottom left hand corner there, we've got um, some of our, our partnership with a, uh, a a local rapper from Mumbai. <laughs> Uh, his name's Rafter, um, who created a, a, a rap, a hip hop rap in the local language, vernacular language in Mumbai around um, pausing and, and how, to how to verify misinformation. This, uh, this, this, um, this song in itself uh, was actually uh, played on radio and was one of the uh, number one, number two top charting songs across Maharashtra. Um, and so picked up a lot of momentum. And in the bottom right corner, we've got a partnership with WikiHow, where we actually developed an online course around how to spot in misinformation. Um, and some of these, um, some of the results that we have, we're still, there's so much, uh, so much content has gone out. We're still um, processing some of the results that we have, but our study with MIT looked at some of these targeted initiatives that we had reduced uh, misinformation sharing by around 10% um, in and higher rates in countries where we're operating some of these partnerships in India, South Africa, Nigeria, and the US. Um, and the other kind of um, stat that we have is the, the misinformation course uh, around how to spot misinformation and how to check sources. Um, the, you know, the, I think you know, we've had about 15,000 people do that. 80% of those people at the end of it um, have said that they're more, they're better equipped now to understand what content is real and not real. And we're actually rolling out that partnership now um, to specific countries. So we're doing one in Spanish for Latin America and Portuguese, and we're rolling that out in, into areas into, into Africa as well. Um, uh, we are running out of time. So I'm going to talk about one more case study. I have many more case studies to talk about, but I'm just going to talk about this one because this is one of my favorites. Um, is uh, as the vaccine was being developed, um, uh, we, you know, uh, working with our partners, the Vaccine Confidence Project, um, we realized that um, this vaccine was going to be like no other in terms of um, uh, the misinformation around it because of, you know, the speed of what the speed of which it was being created would create 
you know, um, concern. Um, and so, uh, and we actually worked with, with Oxford University on one of these, uh, when this first started, we created this initiative called Team Halo. And it was a network, basically Team Halo is a network of trusted messengers. At, at the start of the, of, of the pandemic, we, we actually, it was actually a network of people in the labs creating the vaccine. And we worked with the, the technicians in the lab to train them to um, communicate on TikTok. Um, so using songs and dance to talk about how they were creating the vaccine to build confidence in the vaccine. They would respond to comments, they would have conversations. We placed them in the media, um, we, we gave them media training, we worked with the platforms to verify their accounts, um, to accelerate their accounts, and we also paired them with influencers, key influencers in target audiences that we thought were um, vulnerable to misinformation or not taking the vaccine, so they would get huge access to some of these um, influencer audiences to talk about the vaccine and, and to kind of respond to some of the concerns. As the pandemic uh, continued and moved on, we actually then moved from the lab technicians to doctors. Uh, now we have a massive network of doctors who are continuing to communicate around COVID-19 uh, and the importance of it. Some of those doctors are now using this network. It's kind of gone into its life of, of its own to communicate about, um, about monkeypox, about, you know, I had to take my son three weeks ago to get a polio booster because our GP here in London um, is worried about polio um, spreading in Southeast London at the moment, which is just wild. And, um, and so it encouraged polio up, uh, uptake. And so this network is an incredibly powerful network um, that is um, uh, 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 you know, connected to the UN, but not, you know, not driven by the UN. Um, and that's an incredibly powerful thing. Um, so we have over 100 different, um, 140 actually healthcare professionals all around the world communicating this content who've created over 3000 different videos, generating over 700 million views um, uh, and over 880,000 comments um, engagements that are happening all around the world. Um, uh, and some of the key lessons that we've learned from this is the recruiting these ex experts um, uh, and, and allowing them to really help craft the messages um, and then you working with them to be able to like help them um, understand how to be good communicators online. Um, and what, you know, as the pandemic moved on, we also discovered that, you know, certain ethnic communities groups were very hesitant at the vaccine. And so using trusted messages from them to communicate to them in, the lang in their languages has been a really effective way to, to increase um, uh, uh, COVID vaccination and also encouraging them to be just real, raw and um, uh, authentic has been and it has been kind of the most powerful thing about this network that we've built is that it's it's so engaging and so compelling that people are uh, you know are, are really following these advice uh, the advices of these different trust messages um only got five minutes so I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions okay. yeah yeah thank you thank you lots uh, Gotham it's amazing uh, uh, it's amazing to learn from your uh, case studies. Uh, well, um, let's let's see. We have um, a big room, and uh, we have uh, perhaps some questions in this room. Uh, uh, people who are sitting here at Oxford, I see a few now. All right. Um, uh, do we have any mics in this room? Sure, come in here. Well, no. They can just they, they'll pick it up. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, please. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, the talk today. Um, one of the things that I one of the themes that I kind of noticed in the solutions that both of you have brought up has been a bit of maybe like an assumption that a lot of people when not explicitly emotional will be thinking rationally about the information that they consume. Uh, but when we're talking about things like conspiracy theories, it tends to be driven by a lot of irrational thought in terms of creating alternative explanations of how the world works around them and a desire to create alternative, understa alternative understandings that aren't exactly rational. So I'd be very curious to if any of you had any thoughts on how to really attack the idea of irrational, uh, irrational approaches to understanding the world that really births a lot of these conspiracy theories. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any more uh, questions that emerge in the immediately? Not right now. All right, let's maybe hear uh, both from, from both speakers who would like to start. I, I just say that's, that's it, it's really, really tough. And I think one of the things that I, Gautam also emphasized is trying to get out there um, out first, um, but because once the conspiracy starts, um, 
getting embedded um, and also becoming more popular because that's one of the problems with the social media phenomenon is that the craziest of conspiracies, I mean, think Pizzagate uh, in the US or also QAnon, the QAnon movement, which is just absolute madness, but yet has you know millions of people adhering to it and not just here in the US, but all over the world. So I think we one cannot also, uh, you know, as those who are trying to, um, to you know, uh, give the public access to trusted information, information that is reliable and based on facts and science, we need to look at what's happening out there, what's trending, and not discount discount um, you know viral posts that are insane because they actually could become conventional wisdom in our age. And um, it is then, I think, once, once the conspiracy has taken hold, uh, it, it is, you know, I don't really have, have the answers. Like how, how, do you convince, um, how do you convince all of those Americans who believe that the election was stolen, uh, that it actually um, was not? So it, it, with facts, it does, doesn't seem to work. Um, I do think that um, for the issues that we're working on, um, public health, COVID-19, trying to um, you know, protect vulnerable groups from online hate, um, keeping the history of, for example, the Holocaust um, alive in fact, um, as well as uh, other genocides uh, so that they don't get distorted. Um, you know, we, we just, we have to be that, that counterforce. And also we need to be the alarm system um, because we, we are, and better at monitoring because what we are kind of the, the pulse of the world in what's going wrong with the world as the United Nations. And we can go to those um, distribution networks, the social media networks or the anti-social media networks where the conspiracies are traveling and say, you know, this is becoming a dangerous phenomenon. You need to do something. Um, so I think there are a number of measures. Um, the media literacy piece is also extremely important. There are several parts of the U UN that are working on this, including UNESCO, um, you know, inoculating um, children, getting, um, getting them educated and how to, how to navigate and how to, like Gautam had that, that great uh, post like the five steps that you should take when you see a post um, to determine whether it is um, it is authentic before before sharing it or believing it. Um, it's really amazing how that continues to resonate. I mean, the Secretary General just retweeted just tweeted it the other day, and it got you know thousands and thousands of likes and positive comments and and retweets, and um, so it's hitting a nerve. People are understanding that they're in an environment where they need to. Um, also inoculate themselves, but it is, um, it's, it, it, it is, an, it is not easy. Uh, I don't know if Gotham, if you have anything. Yeah, I think the, the one, one of the lessons we also learned from the, from the work was that like, it's, you know, um, it's really important to, um, you know, not to mock people that share misinformation and have like a very human conversation with them about it and be like, look, we all share misinformation. And then, and that be a really good entry point to to start the conversation. Um, uh, but if you go in and be like, "That's not true," duh, 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 but but if you come from it with compassion and emotion, with you know the partners that we work with talk about that being a really um, a really uh, successful entry point. Um, and it's not you know it's not going to be something that you might be able to solve overnight, but having an open conversation with people and taking them on a bit of a journey um, is what we have found to be if, what we're told is effective from partners and the different organizations that we work with but we're not the experts in that there's a, there's so much thinking out there around that um, and how to combat things like QAnon. Although we did we did put out a guide um, around yeah. communication with the University of, of Florida that it has a, a communications and behavioral science arm that works on um, vaccine uh, communications. And this is an area, of course, that is where there are just so many uh, conspiracies. There already were before COVID-19 and it's just exploded. So what are the strategies? And it's all, it's very similar, um, but what are the strategies to speak to people who have become 
hesitant or completely resistant. Um, it certainly isn't, you know, presenting them the facts. It is having that that empathetic conversation, but also the medical profession has to get much, much better. And so there are lots of tools and recommendations for how doctors can communicate with their patients. And a lot of it is, you know, letting people express their fears um, and, and give listening um, and not, not um, giving them the sense that you don't respect their views and their opinions. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. Exactly. We need to listen to people, but also try to talk to them and follow expert advice and suggestions. Thank you a lot. We don't have, more, uh, unfortunately, any time left uh, um, today, but uh, I, I'm sure we can keep our conversation both offline and at other events. We have a number of great events uh, that uh, will follow this. Uh, I think on Friday is the nearest one and uh, next week at Oxford Theatre Institute. Everyone, welcome to join. Thank you a lot for attending today. Thank you a lot for attention. And again, uh, let's give a round of applause to our great speakers. Uh, thank you a lot. And see you. Thank you.